Good afternoon and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name's Randy Hollerith. I am the Dean of the Cathedral, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here to this special service of choral evensong with the Kirken of the Tartan. It has been the honor of this cathedral to host this service for many, many years. And every year it is a joy and a pleasure to have the St. Andrew's Society here with the pipe and drums and to be able to celebrate this wonderful heritage. So thank you. And a special welcome and thanks to my colleague, the Reverend Dr. David Gray, who's with us this afternoon as our preacher as well. And last but not least, not only are we blessed this afternoon by the Cathedral Choir, but we are especially blessed to have a visiting choir with us this afternoon as well, the Bridgewater Concert Choir from Bridgewater, Virginia. We're so glad that you all are here with us. Let us begin. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whose mercy has given us a new birth into living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise ye the Lord. 
A lesson from the prophet Daniel, in which we hear of the second dream of Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that live throughout the earth, may you have abundant prosperity. The signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me, I am pleased to recount. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his sovereignty is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living at ease in my home and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that frightened me. My fantasies in bed and the visions of my head terrified me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me in order that they might tell me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not tell me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and who is endowed with the spirit of the holy gods. And I told Daniel the dream. O Belteshazzar, Daniel, chief of the magicians, I know that you are endowed with the spirit of the holy gods. The no mystery is too difficult for you. Hear the dream that I saw and tell me its interpretation. Upon my bed, this is what I saw. There was a tree at the center of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew great and strong. Its top reached the heaven, and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it provided food for all. The animals of the field found shade under it. The birds of the air nested in its branches, and from it all living beings were fed. I continued looking in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and there was a holy watcher coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, Cut down the tree and chop off its branches, strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from beneath it and the birds from its branches, but leave its stump and roots in the ground with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let him be bathed with the dew of heaven and let his lot be with the animals in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a human, and let the mind of an animal be given to him, and let seven times pass over him. The sentence is rendered by decree of the watchers. The decision is given by order of the holy ones, in order that all who live may know that the Most High is the sovereign over the kingdom of mortals. He gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of human beings. This is the dream that I, Nebuchadnezzar, saw. Now you, Belteshazzar, Daniel, declare the interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are unable to tell me the interpretation. You are able, however, for you are endowed with the spirit of the holy gods. Here ends the lesson.
lesson from the Gospel according to St. John, Jesus appears to the disciples following his resurrection. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were unable to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring me some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? But they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because it was, he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and you could go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Here ends the lesson.
stand as you are able. Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the state. And And make my chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thy inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Blessed Son didst manifest himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open, we pray thee, the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming works. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, triumphed over the powers of death and prepared for us our place in the new Jerusalem, grant that we, 
who have this day given thanks for his resurrection, may praise thee in that city of which he is the light, and where he liveth and reigneth forever and ever. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for thy love's sake. Please be seated. Deep appreciation to Dean Hollereth and to all of the folks here at the cathedral for continuing this tradition and for all of you for being here this afternoon. The last time I was in a pulpit with so many kilts present, it was 2016. We were on a church tour. We were in Edelston, Scotland, south of Edinburgh. We had arrived early, and two of our kids, aged seven and nine at the time, were running around the sanctuary, amusing themselves before the service began. The service began, and we sat in this, this cold, old church, and it was a bit chilly, and they were looking for their coats, but couldn't remember where they had placed them, and until I made my way to the pulpit to give thanks for our hosts and notice that their jackets there were stuffed right between the microphone and the floor. We returned to our seats and began the service, and later they began to serve communion. I'd explained to our family that there are some things that are different when you go around the world in terms of worship, but we can still connect with Jesus wherever we are. He's still the host there at the Lord's Supper. We can still connect through the elements. There is no telling where Jesus might appear. They began to serve us communion, and we were trying to follow along and fit in and do what everyone else was doing, so they handed us some cups of what I assumed was grape juice, and I handed two to our seven and nine-year-olds, and we began to, to dr drink and partake of the cup, I soon realized that this was not grape juice, but, but rather some sherry wine, so I quickly tried to scoop back the cups from the seven and nine-year-olds, returning them to the lady who had given them to us, who at this point was holding out a basket to receive the empty cups, and she received them with a comment on my parenting, I thought you were being a wee bit generous to the lads. We go through life and perhaps we just follow along. We keep going as we're going and eventually we get stuck. Perhaps that's how we might be feeling this afternoon. Two weeks ago, Easter was, was joyful and now we're back at the routine again and we might feel stuck. What practical impact indeed does this resurrection have on us as we move forward? Well, the good news, dear friends, that it is Eastertide, a season when we celebrate that a stone that was stuck on a tomb was removed, and the disciples that we heard about in our lesson in John 21, and I dare say folks today can get unstuck by following the one who left that tomb behind. That because of Easter, we can believe in ourselves and our calling. Because of Easter, we can share generously of our love, and because of Easter, we need to be on the lookout, because there is no telling where Jesus might appear in our grace, in our mission, and in our trusting. And so let us pray. 
Loving God, may the, the meaning of your word and the opportunity to grow in your likeness by following you be real to each of us here today. In Christ we pray, amen. John 21 tells the story of individuals who were stuck. It tells the story of a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to individuals who were back at work and were not doing all so well at it. These were fishermen and they were unable to find fish. They didn't recognize Jesus. They were back having experienced the resurrection in some ways and, and yet back as if nothing had changed. Perhaps we are the same way sometimes, wondering what impact this event two weeks ago might have for us. Well, the good news of our lesson is that Jesus gets these disciples unstuck by being a wee bit generous to the lads. It is interesting that verse 5 of chapter 21 uses the word children, but, but several of the commentaries say that the best translation is lads. These folks who are unable to find fish, Jesus comes to them, appears to them one morning on the seashore and, and changes their whole strategy. And all of a sudden, in great generosity, they haul in all sorts of fish. One can never tell when the grace of Jesus might appear. And it appears in real terms to Peter in particular. There is a situation very similar to this in John 21 that occurs earlier in the Bible. Luke 5 tells us that the disciples were failing at fishing on the seashore. Jesus turns up to them and, and they catch all sort of fish by following his advice. But that time, Peter says, stay away from me to Jesus, for I am a sinful man. This is Peter who would deny Jesus three times. This is someone who was riddled with guilt and recognized his own sinfulness. Here in John 21, we find a very different approach in a very similar story. They can't find fish, the disciples are stuck. Jesus appears, they get all sorts of fish. But this time, Peter, rather than staying away from Jesus, dives headfirst into the water to try to get close to him. Jesus appears in grace at Easter and offers that grace to us so that Peter and all who follow him can believe in themselves because not our sin separates us from God, not even that. The Easter promise of forgiveness and redemption makes everything new and allows those who would follow in Peter's line to believe in themselves and to draw close to God in a new way. This grand tradition of the Kirken here is one that is built in a way on heritage and individuals thinking about their heritage and their ancestry in a way. There's a wonderful article I read in the New York Times not too long ago about Gerald Grosvenor. He at one time was one of the, the richest men in Great Britain. Grosvenor inherited literally billions of dollars of family wealth much of it came from an occurrence in 1677 when his family gained 430 areas um, and acres of marshy bog that was in the what is now the West End Knightbridge area of London, one of the most expensive real estate parts of the world. Grosvenor was once giving a lecture and he was invited to a class at a business school on entrepreneurship and he was asked if he had any, any advice for young entrepreneurs. And Grosvenor said, well, his advice that was to the young entrepreneurs, whenever possible, always try to have an ancestor who was a close personal friend of William the Conqueror. We who trace our heritage back a long way may or may not be able to go to William the Conqueror, but each of us who try to follow Christ can trace our heritage back to the grace that Peter received. And don't miss the metaphor of Peter jumping into the water to try to be near Jesus. Jumping into the waters is how we recommit ourselves through baptism. At whatever age, whether we're an infant who is baptized or whether it is later in life when we seek to renew 
our Christian vows, we who follow in Peter's line are called and invited during the Easter season to recommit ourselves to the grace that Jesus offers at Easter. And perhaps the invitation is for all who seek to receive and accept that invitation is to offer that kind of, of grace to a broken world. A world where such divisiveness, vitriol between different perspectives, and where individuals offering forgiveness or even admitting mistake is so fleeting that those who have received Easter grace perhaps have the opportunity to extend it to the world that desperately needs it. Friends, Jesus doesn't only show up in our grace, but also in our mission. Because the second part of this lesson from John 21 is this wonderful banter between Jesus and Peter where Jesus asks three times, do you love me? And, and each time Peter replies, you know that I love you. There are different interpretations of the original language, but I, I love looking at the original language and the differences between the word love. Jesus begins by asking Peter, do you love me? And he, he uses a word called agape, which is a special kind of love, John 3.16 love. It is the kind of way in which God chooses to so love the world that he gives his only son. Peter responds by saying, you know that I love you, but he doesn't use the same word in the Greek. He, he says a word, fire. in Peter's case, that mission is to help lead the disciples in what is the formed church. But for you and for me, what is the mission where we might find Jesus calling us to love in our own context. If we are members of a society where relieve the distressed is part of our motto, perhaps it starts with finding a way to be compassionate to the most vulnerable among us. On Earth Day weekend, when we live in a vulnerable world, increasingly so, perhaps if we've come to this part of the country from somewhere else, or if we live in DC, part of our, our calling and invitation is to care for the mission through the, the climate. And maybe it is to act as a shepherd might, shepherds who are so focused on the flock right in front of them that they're able to keep from getting overwhelmed in a way that we might with all the issues around the world. And perhaps it starts with us of just loving that which is most near and dear to us around us. And by changing the life of one sheep near us, we might do our part of living and giving back our love. And friends, the final part of our lesson today is one that seeks to look to the future. You know, that first lesson from the prophet Daniel has a line about generations to generations, and, and this passage from, from John 21 has this past, present, and futureness to it. A young giddy Peter dives into the waters of baptism and then later is given a mission to lead in the prime of his life, so to speak, and near the end is is given this statement about his death that he will eventually be led where he does not want to go. A past focus on sins that have been forgiven, a, a current charge and calling to act in mission, and this, this future foreshadowing of a death that will glorify God. This whole statement about someone else dressing Peter and leading him where he does not want to go is, is fundamentally a statement about Peter needing to give up control. The idea that eventually we are at a place of life where each of us must start to entrust control to somebody else. And what Jesus is trying to offer an invitation to Peter is to learn the lesson of giving up that control now. Because eventually we must trust our future to someone, and the gift of Easter is that we can entrust our future to God. And Peter is given the invitation to begin that journey now. Diving into the waters is giving up control. Changing one's fishing protocol is giving up control. Throwing a net into the water is giving up control. Loving one's lamb and sheep around them, as C.S. Lewis would say, love and your heart may be broken. Loving anything is giving up control. Trusting your future to someone is giving up control. And it is at the point where Jesus says to Peter, this is what the future looks like, where he implies that you can trust me and God with your future because death is no longer the barrier that we thought it was to your being with God, 
It is at that point when the invitation to Peter comes, follow me. It is only at the place where the invitation to live and to give control and trust one's future to God in the Easter glory that has been achieved allows real and true discipleship. So friends, the resurrection indeed matters. Without it, we don't have hope of being unstuck from those things which hold us back. The resurrection matters because without it, we can't believe in God and we can't believe fully in ourselves with all the things that we may be challenged by. The resurrection matters because without it, we cannot give generously of our love in the way that we are called. I mentioned that our two oldest went with me to Scotland in 2016, and our two youngest are going with me this coming June. They have been forewarned by their older siblings to watch out for where dad places the haggis. Apparently, when I went before, I had this tendency to put haggis in all sorts of dishes that my kids were eating, and they never knew where the haggis would turn up. Often I would place this culinarily controversial contribution of Scotland to world cuisine in their hamburgers to just try and get my oldest to try the haggis a little bit. But they've warned their younger siblings that you never know where the haggis is going to turn up. Well, the Gospels help us realize that you never really know where Jesus is going to turn up either, particularly after Easter. Right? I mean, he appears to Mary in a garden in John 20, and she doesn't recognize him till he says her name. A couple pilgrims on the road to Emmaus spend some time talking to Jesus and don't recognize him until they break bread together. And here in John 21, there's this interaction early in the morning on the seashore. And again, Jesus turns up and they don't recognize him and, until they catch some fish. Friends, I don't know what the challenge is that you are facing. If you're like me, perhaps you're carrying a mixed basket of blessings and burdens. But because of Easter, Jesus can show up in our grace. Because of Easter, Jesus can show up in our mission. Because of Easter, Jesus can show up in our trust. That's what Peter and those disciples found out. I wonder where Jesus might show up for you. Amen. Everyone!
present these tartans as tokens of our heritage and ask that you bless them. Let us pray. Bless, O Lord, these simple woven cloths, whose colors warp and woof bear the burden and honor of the history of the land of our ancestors, a people of your own calling, a nation of your creation. May we sustain the glory of all who came before us by wearing the kilt with honest pride and genuine humility, thus honoring your people who bear the name of Scots. We pray that you will bless those who wear the plaid and continue their special loyalty to St. Andrew, who readily obeyed the call of your son, Jesus Christ, and brought his brother with him. Enable us likewise to draw those near to us into the circles of your fellowship. May these tartans be blessed. May the people they represent be a blessing to all in distress. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. In remembrance of their life and service to this society, we now commend to God's care the lives of our fellow members who have died in this past year. We remember and give thanks for John Lang Bowles, Stephen Reed Hammer, William F. Jarrett, Robert John McRab, Dr. Hugh James Francis Robertson, William F. Rollo, David Owen Williams. Eternal Lord God, you hold all souls in life. Give to those servants whom we remember your light and peace. Open to them the gates of life eternal and receive them into your joyful service and presence. Bless their loved ones in their grief and renew your spirit in each of us that we all may give you glory and honor. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, who gave such grace to your apostle Andrew that he readily obeyed the call of your son Jesus Christ and brought his brother with him, give us who are called by your holy word grace to follow him without delay and to bring those near to us into his gracious presence who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in praying together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this night and always. Amen.